Welcome to Code Break. My name is Hadi, and there's so many people joining us across Zoom, on Facebook Live, and on YouTube Live. Together, we're hoping to build the world's largest live interactive classroom. With so many students at home during this virus outbreak, my team at Code.org invites families everywhere to join us for a weekly dose of inspiration, community, and computer science. I'm here with my daughter, Sophia, who's a budding computer scientist. Hello. And she's also my sidekick, and she has a little soundboard, so she's going to make sounds for us during the, this episode. I'd like to introduce our first special guest, Grammy award-winning rapper and songwriter, Ben Haggerty, known to most of you as Macklemore. Uh, Macklemore, are you there with us? I am, yes, how's it going? Good, great, how are you? I am fantastic. So I have a first question. Should I be calling you Ben or Macklemore? Uh, ben is great. Ben is great? Does your, yeah. I guess, uh, I was, we were wondering which, which way to go. So, Macklemore has so many syllables. It's so difficult to pronounce. How does it actually play out to the ear? It's just challenging. Ben is easier. Mom doesn't call you Macklemore either? No, I, I, I do request that she calls me Macklemore, yes. That's the only person. <laughs> How are you handling being at home? What have you been doing? Uh, what have you been working on during this time? I have been, you know, I have a almost five-year-old daughter and I have a two-year-old daughter. So I have been very active on the parenting front. I have been making some music. I have been um, just kind of, it, it's ups and downs, you know? Okay, it kind of goes hour to hour, what's going on. A lot of walks in the neighborhood. Um, you know, we've been watching some movies at night, doing some schoolwork. It's, it's all over the place. And do you have any message to give to students who are all at home with school closed all around the world to inspire them about the importance of learning during this time? I think it's super important for, for all of us to keep our brain engaged. To, you know, for me, it was super important to create some sort of routine. When I find myself like, okay, what am I doing today? I'm just kind of floating. That's when, you know, my mood can kind of go up and down and life gets a little bit weird. I think that what I've found during this, this pandemic is that structure is really important for me and keeping the brain active, you know, still focusing, you know, if you're in school, still focusing on schoolwork and making sure that we're just doing our, our very best, you know? Um, and that goes for all of us, whether you're in, elementary school, middle school, high school, or you're an adult, I think just keeping the brain going really helps overall just keep our emotions even keel. Well, thank you for sharing that. Um, well, to change the mood a little bit, Sophia's gonna get us started with the computer science joke of the day. Sophia, ready? Yes. What is a computer's favorite type of music? <laughs> I have no idea. It is disc O. Ah, nice. Disc O. All right. Well, uh, you know, there's, a, there's just the two of us that have been talking, but we, I want to introduce you to the rest of our live audience. Uh, we have a few dozen students on camera, uh, and you can see them uh, right now. And by the way, Macklemore, if you don't, or Ben, if you don't see them at all on your screen, you may need to click this button. So if you see mainly me, you can click this button on your screen, which will show you the rest of the students. Uh, most people see a whole grid of students, but that button would uh, it'll, it'll be in the upper right hand side of your screen if you want to click that to see them. Um, right. And that's just a set of folks who are on camera. Can you all wave hello and say hi all at once? We're going to unmute you. Hi. 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 Rest of our audiences, by the way, because that's just the folks on camera. If we do a I'm going to do a quick screen share as people were joining this call. We should map uh, so you can actually see this map of where everybody's calling from. Uh, you know, the, this live Zoom call has almost a thousand students calling from as far west as as Hawaii, where it's like 7 a.m. and 
uh, far east as far as New Zealand or Australia or Japan. Wow. Uh, it's pretty incredible to see the set of people who are calling. I have one of my own cousins calling from Iran right now. Uh, wow. So that's amazing. It's, it's incredible the number of students who are basically online at the same time uh, here for education. So one thing I want to say as we go through this episode, for those of you who are new, if you have any questions during the episode, whether for me or for Macklemore, for our other special guests, you can go to code.org slash questions to learn about it. And today's uh, episode is going to be super fun. Today we're going to learn about events, and we have three parts. We're going to learn about events unplugged in computer programming, and then we're going to code our own dance, and then we're going to learn about how to use events in apps. Uh, we're going to start, as always, with the easy material first. We have a lot of beginners. If you're more advanced, please be patient until we get to the more advanced stuff. Uh, and then, just so you know, our, our audience ranges from age six all the way to 60 or more, uh, although the probably the biggest group is basically 12-year-olds or 13-year-olds or 11-year-olds like Sophia. Uh, nice. Uh, before we go into lesson, the lesson, I want to welcome some guests to demo the stuff that they created from last week's challenge was to modify our alien coin game or to, to make your own storytelling app. And each week when you share your creations with us, we'll invite the best ones on the episode uh, to, to meet with our special guests. So the first thing I want to do is screen share to show Rifki's app. Uh, so Rifki, are you there with us? Yes, hello. And where are you calling from? Calling you from Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia. Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia. So let me show his app in Macklemore. You can take a look at this. So this app starts as a full iPhone screen and you get to tell a story. So we're gonna to click to see what stories are available. Uh, let's pick story number two and you get to enter. It's basically kind of an ad lib. Macklemore, do you want to, uh, Ben, do you want to help us with this by choosing a name and an adjective? Oh, a get, oh man, the adjectives and the nouns. This is going to, what, what it's an adjective. This is where I'm okay. going to be embarrassed because we're supposed to be learning. And here I am not knowing what an adjective is. <laughs> so For some reason I had, you know, I had a lapse of language arts and the very formative years of learning adjectives and nouns. No worries. So we'll use the name Ben. Sophia, you want to pick an adjective? Thank um, you, Sophia. Save me. Um, odd. Odd. And I'll use another one, fast. And another one, super cool. And then for a noun, we'll do a ball. And another noun will be a car. And an object will be a battery pack. Battery pack. <laughs> and now Ripke's code is going to tell us a story. One day, Ben went to an odd ball to look for a battery pack, but crashed into a fast car. It was a truly super day. That's, that's a cool story. That's yeah, awesome. Uh, Rifki, thank you for joining us. Uh, and let's, I want to show the next apps that our students made from Bangalore, India, Sharanya and Miranlini made two games. Uh, these are basically remixes of the alien coin game that we made uh, last week. Uh, and I'm not sure which one is on which side. Unfortunately, these two couldn't join us tonight. Uh, well, to the, this morning, because for them, it's really, really late at night. Hi. So, oh, are you here, Shania and Miralini? Yes, we are here. Oh, hey. Hi. Hi, Hi there. Uh, sorry, I thought you weren't going to be on screen. It's great to have you. So which one of you made which one of these? I made the game in that is that the alien is collecting gold medals. And I made the game with the pink alien collecting the rubies and emeralds. All right. Well, thank you so much for both of you. Uh, I'm going to stop the screen share, but I just want to say thank you to Rifki, to Sharanya, to Miranlini, and to all the students who have made uh, apps or games each week from the challenges that we send uh, to you each week. And at the end of the episode, we're going to share out uh, how you can sign up to get our weekly challenges to come on the show for next week. So to start this week's uh, episode, our word of today is events. 
When we program a computer, we use events to tell the computer to do things in response to the user. For example, we might tell a computer that when the user clicks on an apple, add one to the score, or when the up arrow key is pressed, move the screen up. And today we wanna to model this with Macklemore and with our students on camera with a fun event that is gonna involve dancing, as long as everybody's ready to dance. Uh, so Ben, we sent you a secret packet <laughs> yesterday. Did you receive our secret packet? Yes, I chance? have the secret packet. All right, ooh, and it says do not open until the show. Can you open that up and tell us what you see inside there? Absolutely. Looks like I got some some letters here. All right, let's see your letters. Some secret letters. A. Whoa. B. And C. All right. So <laughs> very secret. Thank you. So what we want to do is we want Ben to use events to choreograph all of us to dance. And when I say all of us, I mean everybody, not just Sophia and myself, but everybody who's on camera and even those of you who are not on camera. And the way we're going to do this using events is when an event happens, we're going to do a dance move. And an event is when Ben holds up his card, whether it's an A or a B or a C. And for each one of those, we're going to have a different dance move. So let's start with what dance move should we do when the when Ben is holding up an A. We're going to do an audience poll to let the audience choose the first dance move when we do the letter A. Can we put up the poll on screen? So you, the uh, everybody can choose between a clap, a knee kick, a dab, or a floss. This is going to look like a slightly tight race here. Uh, all these votes coming in. Oh my gosh, it's a really tight race between the dab and the floss. All right, uh, we have 78% of you have voted. I think we're gonna need to run this to the end to make sure we get a, a final winner. The floss is barely ahead of the dab. This is a pretty tight election. What do you think, Ben? This is intense. I. It's kind of intense. We're gonna have to go individual counts. <laughs> All right, let's close the polls. We're not done, but I'd say the floss is the winner. Ooh, close. So when, so when the A key is pressed, and this is the code that maps to that, when the when sorry, when an A is showing, our dancers are gonna floss. And Sophia, do you want to model that for us so, so that we know what a floss looks like for anybody who's not familiar? Yes. So when an A is pressed, that's the floss. All right, so Ben, we want you to choose the next dance move. So when a B is is pressed, uh, what would you like? You can your choices are a dab, a clap, or a kick. Uh, you know, I'm gonna have to go with uh, the classic knee kick. The knee kick. All right. So Sophia, it was in last to... place. I felt bad for the knee kick. The knee kick. <laughs> so Sophia is doing a knee kick. Yep. So. When a B is showing, everybody's going to knee kick. So when a B is showing, we want you to knee kick. And you want to pick for our last move, Ben, for a C. When the C is showing, your choices are, I think, a clap now or a dab. I think we got a dab. Got a dab. Sophia, you want to model that for everybody to know what a dab looks like? Dab. I think everyone knows. No, no, no. Do it, do it well. Not everybody knows what a dab looks like. There's a dab. All right, so when a C is showing, the dancers are going to dab. So I want to review this one more time. This is a very simple program we've written, and I want everybody to be doing this. When an A is showing, our dancers are going to floss, and Macklemore is going to be generating these events. Our code is that when a B is showing, we want to kick, and when a C is showing, we want to dab. So A is floss, B is kick. C is dab. And Ben, when you're showing these, I want you to uh, also say the letters as well in case somebody has trouble seeing your camera uh, so it. they can follow along with your voice as well. So I think we're all going to do this dance. And I actually have a very special guest who hasn't ever joined us on Code Break, which is my six year old son, Mazi. He's going to join us as well. Hi. So I'm going to start the song. Ben, are you ready to give us our events? I'm ready to go. All right, and are all the dancers ready? Everybody on the screen is ready. So we're gonna start this dance. Ready, 
set, go. Hey. D. Well, that was wonderful. <laughs> Thank you for leading us in that, Ben. I'm sure that wasn't what you were expecting when you got on the Zoom call. Uh, that was awesome. And we're sending off Muzzy off. Uh, well, that was the first live dance party coded on, on a, a code break. So what I wanted to do is actually see if we could write code to make the exact same dances happen but using code now, using uh, basically a, a tool on, on code.org called Dance Party. And Sophia here is gonna actually be my partner in crime coder and she's gonna basically code the exact same dance moves for us. To do this, I'm gonna screen share. So just one second as my share my screen. All right, if you all see my screen over here on the left, we're on code.org's Dance Party. And on the left is going to show where the dancers are. On the right is where Sophia is going to make the code. And over here in all these little categories, we have the commands she can use. So Sophia, to start, do you want to uh, set up and give us a background for our, okay. for our dance world? And Ben, do you want to help us choose a background? Sophia, what are your two favorites? My favorites are the fireworks in the laser dance floor. Oh, laser <laughs> dance floor. Laser dance floor it is. All right, and Sophia, now put a dancer on the screen. Like, Making a cat. You like a cat, don't yes, you? Yes, always a cat. All right, and no. put him in the center of the screen. All right, and now we want to use events just like we did all in person. So go into the events area and say when a key is pressed. But right now it says when the up arrow is pressed, change that to the when the A key is pressed. And if you remember, we said when the A shows, the dancers are going to floss. So, let's so them. yep, choose that one and make sure, and make sure it's cat, just the cat. Yeah, the cat is going to floss and the dance move is going to be a floss. And now uh, we can copy and paste to say when the B key is pressed. So you click on that block and copy and paste it and say when the B key is pressed. And this is our code we wrote before when B is showing the dancers kick. and choose, Find kick. you want to be a kick. And now we copy again using Command C to copy the block and Command V to paste it. It's up here, it's up here, so if you did it. Erase my other one. Oh, I see. And then the last one is dab. Is a dab, so when you want to say when the C key is pressed. Make sure these are all cats. Yeah. You want the cats. Dab. dab. So the A makes a floss, the B is a kick, and the C is a dab. And before we run this, uh, one thing I point out, want to point out is last time when we played a song, it was kind of a song that nobody had ever heard before. Uh, ben, were you familiar with that song? I'm guessing you weren't. Uh, but for Code.org's Dance Party, with the reason we chose a song nobody had ever heard is because you don't want to use music in a way that's not licensed. Uh, it's one of the things we teach in computer science is the importance of copyrights and licensing music. But we're very lucky in code.org that we actually have all these awesome songs that were licensed. And in fact, the song Can't Hold Us by Macklemore and Ryan Lewis was the very first song that, that code.org got the rights to use for educational purposes. So we're going to use that song for Sophia's dance. And now she's going to control the dancers when we hit the run button. So ready, set, go. Those are some big kicks, Sophia. So we can see Sophia made her own little dance party where she's controlling it. But one thing we could do with events is we can have a dance off where Sophia and I compete 
So I'm actually going to now write some code to make a second dancer to compete with Sophia's little cat dancer. Uh, and Ben, I want your help to make my dancer way cooler than Sophia's. So no way. Yes. No. So, so mine is going to be a what? What kind of dancer should I be? How about I could be either a robot or a shark. What would you prefer? Let's go shark. Shark. I'm going to be a shark, and we're going to move Sophia on the right. That's where I am. And I'll be on the left. Shall we change to fireworks as our background? Yeah. That was your other favorite. Mm -hmm. And I'm also going to give us a foreground effect. Let's have a be stage lights. That's my. You like stage lights? Yeah. All right. And I'm going to copy the code that Sophia had, Command C, Command V. And I'm going to use the right side of the keyboard. So I'm going to have. The left. Well, it depends. Well, yeah. yeah. So I'm going to say when the J key is pressed, I'm going to have the shark do a move. Uh, and I'm going to pick it to be, I don't know. Uh, so Ben, what would you prefer? You can choose between a body roll. A, uh, I, I like a body roll. I think that's a strong play. Body roll is good. All right. And let's have the audience pick my other dance moves. So let's do a poll for everybody to vote on the favorite dance moves we do next. If we could put a poll up on the screen. No poll. Is the poll showing or not? All right, so we have a okay. choice between that. We've already used the body roll, so choose between disco, kick, and zombie. Oh, we already used the kick too. Okay, let's do zombie. All right. Alex. All right, so, all right, I'm going to go with the disco and the zombie because those are the popular ones. So we're going to have, when the K key is pressed, we're going to have the cat, the sharks do a zombie. This is going to be a zombie move. And when the L key is pressed, what was the last? Disco. Disco. The sharks will do a disco move. All right. So we're ready for our dance off. Ready, set, go. Yeah. Let's go. All right. All right. OK. All right. All right, Ben, which one of us do you think is doing better? Uh, I think, I think the cat is dominating. More body roll, more body roll. <laughs> All right, so you could see a fun dance off we did. And by the way, one of the cool things we could do is we can actually make an entire world of dancers come be around us. And I didn't show this, but you can have like 20 different people off in the background to make this, which is like our entire audience of bears in the background. But I want to do a quick audience vote to see who was the better dancer between <laughs> Sophia's cat and Hadi's shark. So who won the dance off? This is going to be a tight one. Oh, wow. People are, vote for me. Don't vote for my daughter. Oh, man. All right, let's share the results. I think Sophia won the dance off. You guys are my favorite. All right, uh, we have just a little bit of time, uh, Ben. We're going to do a quick lightning round of questions before we say goodbye to Ben. So, Ben, what we've done uh, each week, our special guest gets 60 seconds to ask some very short questions. And your goal is to give good answers, but as, as quickly as possible to see who can answer the most questions. And our record so far is uh, nine questions were answered by Sal Khan of Khan Academy. So that's the record to beat to get a high score. <laughs> You ready? Yep. So are you ready? Yeah. Go. Your favorite article of clothing? Jeans. Your favorite smell? Cologne. An activity you can easily get sucked into for hours? Video games. A country you've always wanted to visit but haven't? Canada. The first thing you've ever bought on your own with your own money? The first thing? The song you know all the words to. Uh, can't hold us. Something you wish you could have learned as a kid. Uh, what an adjective is. What are your feelings about pineapple on pizza? Love it. What can always make you laugh? My wife. Something you can eat every day. Pizza with pineapple. Favorite drink? 
Water. As a kid, what do you want to be when you grew up? Musician. Best book you've ever read? The Giver. Yes. Okay. Wow. Ben got our new high score of 13 questions Woo. in 60 seconds. Uh, I, would be, I was sweating there just watching how quickly. I was really it. trying to beat the record. I don't, you know, I mean, I, I love Canada, but that's not true. I just wanted to beat the record. You just, just throwing words and answers out there to go fast. All right, that's awesome. Well, thank you, Ben. And I know Ben's short on time. So thank you so much for spending uh, time with us on Code Break. And can we give Ben a quick round of applause? And if we could put the audience in gallery mode to all say goodbye to Ben. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you guys so much for having me. It was awesome. Awesome. Thank you so much. Bye. Bye-bye. See you guys. And before we welcome our next special guest, one thing I wanted to point out that Sophie and I were wearing code.org gear that we sent you an email. If you want to get a dance party shirt with the dance characters or a code like a girl yeah. shirt like Sophia's got or the code hat or the code earrings, you might not be able to. These are all available. If you want to get any of those, uh, they're available at, at Amazon. Uh, and if you want to find the link to our store, you can go to code.org slash shop or you could just search for them on Amazon. You can search for code.org shirts and find those. Uh, I would like to have our next special guest join us. Uh, is Scott Forstall on yet? I am. All right. Hi there, Scott. How are you doing? Hey, I'm doing great. So Considering Scott, that we're all locked at home right now, I'm doing OK. <laughs> where are you calling us from? Uh, Northern California, uh, Silicon Valley. Awesome. Well, yeah, it's been a tough. It's been a tough time being all here at home uh, alone and, and, and trying to deal with life on, on Zoom and video conferencing. Scott is a dear friend. I, I met Scott when I was, I think, 18 and you must have been 19 when we were both summer interns at Microsoft. Uh, and Scott went on to join Apple and, and has been the inventor and creator of many of the technologies many of us use, the most famous of which being the iPhone and iOS. So it's just such an honor to have you uh, on to talk, to talk to us about your experience learning about computer science and computer programming and so on. Um, before we get into that, I wanted to do a very quick trivia question. It's trivia time. So our, our trivia question, if we're going to put this poll up on screen, is the question is, what was the very first mouse, the first computer mouse made of? The options are metal, wood, and plastic. And you can see everybody's making their guesses. Metal, wood, or plastic for a computer mouse. Wow, it's kind of a tight nice. vote. Yeah, so we, Scott, do you know the answer yourself? Uh, the first one I ever saw was made of wood. All right, so let's share the audience results. Everybody thinks the first computer mouse was made of wood. That is not the guess that I would have made. Uh, but let me share the answer. If you see on my screen, the very first computer mouse was made of wood and it looks incredibly clunky. Uh, <laughs> and you can see this little wheel, it could really kind of not go in so many directions. Um, and the reason it was called a mouse, this is showing it next to the first one of the first computers. And you can see the little string coming out of the back of the mouse. Mouses, computer mouses were not wireless, they used to have a little wire and the wire coming out of the back of it is why we even call it a mouse, because it looked a little bit like a mouse. Uh, all right, that's it for trivia times. So Scott, I want to talk a little bit about your background. Um, and while Scott is talking, I also want to share, if people can, at any point, if you have questions for Scott or for myself, uh, you can go to code.org slash questions to, to submit a question to ask Scott at the end of the episode. So um, the other thing I want to say is while Scott and I are chatting, I want the students who are on camera, those of you on scam, camera, uh, and if you're at home as well, take a piece of paper and sketch out your design for the home screen of a phone of the future. So we have somebody who designed the most popular phone that, that we're all using, the iPhone and iOS, but imagine the phone of the future. If you could skip past the idea of a phone with just a bunch of icons of apps and make up your own screen for the home screen of a phone, what would it be on? Later on, we're gonna share some of these designs with Scott and see what he thinks. Uh, uh, so Scott, um, 
I'd like to hear a little bit about your childhood. I know you had some pretty challenging circumstances growing up. Can you share about basically what it was like growing up, how you got into computer science and how, you, how that helped you effectively build a better life for yourself? Yeah, definitely. Um, you know, when I was a kid, uh, we moved up to Washington. And when we got there, we didn't have anywhere to live. Uh, and so my, my parents found a friend who convinced their neighbor to let us live at their place for a while. And when that, when that ended and we had to leave, we moved into uh, a tent in a park. And so for a while, our family, like we were living in this, this tent and I remember we had to uh, like walk down the road to the shared bathroom. It had a shower and you had to pay for hot water. And it cost 25 cents for two minutes of hot water. And I remember my dad uh, declaring that we had enough money for 50 cents per week for my older brother and me to take showers. Uh, so each of us got one quarter uh, and could take a two minute hot water shower. And the very first time I went down there, this is uh, up in Seattle, it's or west of Seattle, it's uh, fall, so it's really cold. I hopped in the shower, I'm soaping up, two minutes pass really fast when you're a little kid in a shower, and suddenly it was ice cold water coming out. And, and I had soap all over. And it was way too cold, so I hopped out, I dried off, and for a week, I had just soap drying on me, uh, which is not great for your skin, not great for you at all. Uh, and so next week, I figured out a better way of doing it, which is get a little wet, get all the soap on, jump in for two minutes to rinse off. But let me tell you, when, when that kind of thing happens, uh, it, is, it is a formative experience. Uh, I said to myself, I never want to to reach a point as an adult where I'm living in a tent. Uh, and so the way to guarantee that was through education. Like there was no doubt, you know, I had to go, I wanted to concentrate on my education, get a great education all through elementary school, high school, college, beyond. And that'd be the way uh, out. Now, when I look back on it, I think that we probably could have done more than we were doing at the time with my parents and they were very frugal. Um, but you know, for a, for an eight year old, uh, what you see is like, you go home from school and you end up in this tent. So it's really, it's really <laughs> touching, but just to imagine, I mean, right now in America, there's millions of people who are homeless and globally hundreds of millions of people who are homeless. And especially during this pandemic period, when school is closed, uh, the children don't have a place to go. To, you know, there's, there's not a home that they're staying at necessarily. And to think that there's eight-year-olds out there right now that might be homeless, that one of them might invent the next iPhone uh, is just interesting to think to think about and how important education is to give all of them the opportunity to, 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 to basically have a track like you did or just even the opportunity to get a great job. Right. Uh, no, education is the way. And again, I, I did not have the experience that so many people out there are having that are homeless uh, and uh, and... The experience right now with the pandemic, which is so difficult where people can't even see their friends in person, uh, is really, really hard. And so, uh, you know, thank goodness for the technology that we've had created over the last five, 10 years that's made this a little more doable, but still uh, it, is, it is very, very difficult for people out there. And you, uh, can you tell us a little about, you basically got into a pretty good college and then got recruited by Steve Jobs. Can you tell us about the story about how that happened? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so yeah, I got into a great college and took out a huge number of loans and I couldn't afford the school without a lot of loans. And then I worked the entire time uh, I was in college. Um, and when I, when I finished my graduate work, uh, there were two places I was looking. I was looking at Microsoft where I had been an intern with you and, and others uh, and uh, at Next. And Next was the computer company that Steve Jobs had started when he left Apple. And uh, I, I was pretty interested in both. I mean, Next I thought had amazing technology uh, and amazing people. Did not have a lot of customers, unfortunately, but had a uh, great technology. So, I went to this interview they'd set up and it was an intense interview. It was like 17 people 
throughout the course of an entire day. And I was in the very first interview and I was maybe 10 minutes into this interview and Steve Jobs bursts in, into the room and he grabbed the person who was interviewing me and took them out to the hallway, which was behind me. And they were having this really animated discussion, just like talking and, and uh, something was happening that was big. And I was waiting and waiting and waiting for my interview to continue. And eventually I heard the door open and my interview came back in, but it wasn't the person who had been interviewing me. It was, it was Steve Jobs. And he just started peppering me with question after question after question. And after about 15 minutes, we really, we really clicked uh, on design, uh, philosophy, and a bunch of other things. He stopped and he looked at me and he said, I know you have to interview for the rest of the day. I don't care what anyone says uh, at the end of the day, I'm giving you an offer. Uh, and then he said, but please, you know, pretend you're interested in, in everyone's questions uh, throughout the rest of the day. <laughs> and, uh, and, and then he looked at me and he said, and I'm sure you're, gonna, you're going to accept this offer. So this is his way to just convince me. Now, I had an offer from Microsoft, so I called up Microsoft or, you know, one of my contacts there uh, and turned down their offer. And the next day... When I woke up and I opened the door to my apartment, there was a box outside. I opened it up and it was a dead fish. It was this huge dead fish. And I looked at the box and it had a return address of Microsoft. This seems like a threat. Uh, I, I, call, I called up my contact at Microsoft and I said like, uh, you know, I've watched movies with the mafia and uh, I know that when you send someone a dead fish, you're trying to, to scare them. What, what message are you sending? And they said, no, 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 no. We, we're trying to convince you to come to Seattle, to Microsoft. And so the moment you said no, we rushed down to the Pike Place Market, which is that place in Seattle where they throw fish around and they bought the largest king salmon they could find and they packed it in ice and overnighted it to me. And so this was, to try to convince me, I guess that you know there's no fish I'd be able to buy in the Bay Area uh, and to come back to Seattle, um, which is very funny. I, I, I cooked the fish that night on a barbecue. It was delicious, but I ended up going and working with Steve Jobs for the next 20 years. That's awesome. Well, thanks for sharing that story. Uh, it's always amazing to hear about different people's pathways and to, to start from a tent to end up working for Steve Jobs at Apple is pretty cool. Uh, we want to move into the last segment of our episode today, which is learning. We've been learning about events and we want to learn about using events in apps. We're going to do this with my son, Darius, who's going to sit down next to me. Hi. Hey, Darius. Darius is 13 and he's a big fan of the iPhone. He has an iPhone that he's pretty psyched about. Uh, what we're going to do is we're going to use code.org's app lab to design an escape room app. Uh, and first of all, I want to talk about their use of events in, in making apps. Events play a key role for designing user interface. When you're designing an app, part of the design is the look and feel, but actually the more important part is the interactivity. Anytime a user clicks or types or does anything, that generates an event, and the interactivity comes from the code that you write, the event handler that manages what happens when that event happens. Uh, while I get open up App Lab, uh, Scott, have you done escape rooms before? I love escape rooms. Actually, it's one of the things my family is quite addicted to. Uh, we do, there's some great ones in San Francisco. Uh, Palace Games is amazing. And they even have some online ones. And then every time we travel to a given city, we find an escape room to do. So an escape room for anybody who's not familiar is basically a room that you need to get out of by solving a puzzle. We're gonna make one of these inside App Lab. I'm sharing my screen right now, and we've actually started this off a little bit to, to get part of it, you know, to, to get the high level design work and then we're gonna write some of the code for it. So what you see here is a room with a door and a picture and a safe. Uh, and I'm gonna start running it to just see the starter code, what it does. So if you click run, and I'm gonna guess that there's something inside the safe. So if I click the safe, you see a prompt that says enter the code, but I don't know what code to enter. Uh, so I'm not sure what's going to happen. So we need to write some code here that says on the event that the safe is clicked, 
we're going to prompt the user to enter the code and store that in the variable guess. And then here it says, if guess equals something, we can show the inside of the safe. So Scott, what would be a good code for, for people to have to guess? Uh, like a four or five Darius's code. birthday. Darius's birthday. Darius's birthday. Is that a safe code to give? <laughs> <laughs> no, let's go uh, uh, with uh, 1986. 9286. That's nobody's birthday. So now if you type 9286, here's click run. Reload. Okay, here we go. That was lucky. Um, so if we if we click run, and if we click the safe, it asks for the code, and we say nine two eight six, and we hit OK. It shows the inside of the safe. Um, that's because this code here that says if the guest was nine two eight six, show the inside of the safe. Uh, but we also want to show something else. You can see there, there's sort of a hidden key. So Darius, can you pick the show element block? It's a little bit farther down over here. Show element and drag it in there. So that in, besides showing the inside of the safe, we also show the key. Here. Yeah. yeah. Now, uh, when we do that, we can click run and then click on the safe and then type 9286 and hit OK. And that shows the key. But how is somebody going to know that the, the code is 9286? Uh, we can hide that code somewhere. Where would you like to hide it, Darius? Under the painting. We could put it under the painting. So I'm going to put it behind the painting. So I'm going to go in design mode. And this is, painting is basically an image object. If I move it back, I can go here. And Darius, can you type the, the 9286 over here? All right, so we have that in that little label there, but we're going to hide it behind the painting again. Uh, but then we can write code again for what happens if you click the painting, we can unhide the code. And we also have this in our starter code, so it says on event that the picture is clicked, set its position somewhere. So do you want to change and pick a new position for the, for the picture? When we click it, we can change its position. The top left would be good. All right, so you want to pick an X and Y. Of 20 and... Try 2020. And notice when you put your mouse over there on the screen, it shows the X and Y of different spots if you're not sure. So now click the run button. And now if you click the painting, you can see the code 9286. Now we can escape the room by using the safe. Click on the safe. And you can enter that code that you got from the painting. And now it shows the key. And then what happens when we click on the key? We need something for that too. So now we need an event for what happens when we click the key. So okay. to create that event, uh, go and click and choose another event block. At the top, you see on event. And now we're using events on the event that the key is clicked. So choose the key. Now we want to move the key as well. So make another set position block. And let's move the key to the, uh, let's say to the bottom left of the screen. So can you hover around the bottom left of the screen? And I want to ask the audience, where would it, where, what would be the X and Y location for making the bottom of the screen? So let's show the poll for the audience to guess that. So what should X and Y be equal to? So we have the options of X of 30 and Y of 400, X of uh, 400 and Y of 30, X of 30, Y of 30, X of 400, Y of 400. I think the second one might be a typo on our part. All right, so if we could share the results of the guesses, the most popular guess is X is 30 and Y is 400. Now, this is something I want to share in math class. The bottom left would be kind of a small x and a small y. When you're looking at computers, the x of 0 and y of 0 is at the upper left, whereas in math, x of 0 and y of 0 is in the bottom left. 
Scott, do you remember why uh, for computers, the Y of zero is at the top and not the bottom? Uh, well, it turns out it actually depends on the coordinate system of your view system at the time. So different ones have different places. Uh, I guess I don't remember the, the reason that in general it starts top left. Yeah, so it's actually something whoever makes the operating system can decide. So whenever you made iOS, you chose how that coordinate system would work. The historical way, reason is because computer screens used to have a sort of cathode gray tube and there was a scan that would actually individually draw the pixels and it would draw them like when you read a book from the top to the bottom. Uh, and so that was the first why. Uh, so, but everybody's guess was right. So let's put the key position to go to 30 and 400. So when you click the key, it's going to move to 30 and 400. And then once the key is out, if you look a little bit lower in this code, it says if the door is clicked, the door doesn't usually open unless the key is in the right spot. Because if you click on the door, it says if the position of the key is something, show something. So let's set that so that uh, if the key is at 30, at the X position is at 30, what should we show? Click the show element, it's got a little drop down there. Uh, let's show the outdoors. That'll open the door. So if the key has been clicked, then we can finally open the door. So now let's hit run to see how this works. So first we need to click the painting to get our secret code. Now we got the code. We can open the safe by entering 9286. Now we got the key. Click the key. All right. Now that the key is out of the safe, we can click to open the door. Awesome. So now we Yay. escape the room. Scott, are there any ideas to improve on this? Yeah, 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 so I have a question. So when the, the key moves to the bottom and then you have to click the door to open it, that seems a little confusing to me. Uh, I mean, it seems to me that you want the key when you click on it from the safe to actually open the door. You want the action of the key to be to move to the door and open it. Because uh, it doesn't seem when clear. Darius and I use why. keys, we always throw it on the floor and that's how we do it, right? You, you <laughs> throw the key on the floor to open the door. Isn't that the normal way? That's, that's if it's uh, you know, the kids clothes that they're not putting the hamper. <laughs> so you're saying let's have the key move to the door when you click it. Yeah, I think you can simplify this a lot by moving the key directly to the door. All right, so let's have the key when you click it, set the position. We just have to move it up because it's at we, the right edge. So let's move a different Y position. And do you want to have to click the door or do you want the door to just automatically open I think you could do either. I think you could either have it so when the key goes to the door, it opens the door, or when the key is on the door, now it's unlocked. And if you click either the key or the door, the door opens. All right. Which one do you want to do, Darius? I want to do the way we already have. Oh, yeah, less work for now is to make it the way we already have. So click run. All right. You can't open the door yet. Try opening the door. It doesn't work. Try opening, click the picture. See if you need the code. We know, we, know, well, we know the code. It's 9286. Yeah. Now click the key. And now the key goes to the right place, a nicer place. And now you can open the door. Although I'm not sure why it's not working. Oh, oh, there there go. you go. Awesome. All right. It's because the key icon is probably larger with alpha. Yeah, the key icon is covering parts of the door. So maybe your way would have been better to make the door automatically open up. So we're going to share out this uh, app for people to basically make their own escape room app. And I want to give an example of something that somebody else made. This is a slightly more complicated escape room using very much the same code that we wrote. So you can do something more innovative. You don't need to use the same code. But we are here in a kitchen with a fridge and a microwave. And the microwave is asking us for a code. Uh, which we don't know. But if you click this little thing, it gives you this code of 968692. And then I can type this 8692 code. And the microwave has a key inside it. And if I key. click it, the fridge opens to show another room. And then if I click, I can go into this other room, which in App Lab is changing the screen. So now there's a door and there's a mat. There's nothing under the mat. There's a safe, but I bet I need a code for that. If I click the clock, it says nope, but if I click the coat rack, it shows me the code 5248. So I can now type that in here, 5248. And now I get another key and I click that and it opens the door to get me out. So you can make 
more and more complicated escape rooms if you'd like. Uh, but that's the challenge that we're going to send you for, for after today's code break is done. Uh, so one thing I want to talk about before we finish, you know, thank you for helping us with that app. Uh, Scott, I want to ask a little bit more about the importance of design and ask you a little bit about the initial days of working on the iPhone. What are the, some of the challenges you faced? What are some of the design things you needed to get past? And, and how did you work through them? Yeah, uh, when we started the iPhone, uh, we were building something totally different than anything we'd ever seen before. And so the important thing about everything we always built at Apple is we started with design. So we didn't start with technology. Technology is in service to other things, but it is not the end goal. And so when we were building the phone, uh, the biggest design decision we had was making a touchscreen, which we were already working on a tablet project. Uh, and so we started using that technology for it, but we want it to be touch. And then there's the question of the keyboard. And that was the hardest problem of the entire project is can we make a keyboard that's not physical buttons? Because at the time, all the phones out there had physical buttons, right? So like the BlackBerry had these little teeny tiny plastic buttons and that took up half the screen. And so you only get another half the screen for, you know, to see things and half the front of the face of the device is, is a keyboard all the time, even when you're not using it. And so we wanted to make the entire thing into a display but it meant we had to have a keyboard that could work. Uh, and it was unclear if that was possible. We, we bet on it and you know, we were going, we we're maybe a year into the project and the keyboards weren't working yet. Uh, and this is the important thing, like design is about both the, the visuals and the usability. And so we were about a year in and I paused all work on software, on all the applications, on all of the designs, and we spent 100% of our time just working on keyboards to try to find a solution. And uh, people came up with crazy design, you know, sliding designs and, and you know, pie-shaped designs. Uh, and some of them worked really well, but they'd be incredibly hard to, to learn. And it's important to know that when you're designing something, you might understand it in your head because you've created it. But someone else, when they're new to it, are going to struggle to understand where you're coming from. So we wanted to have something that looked natural. And that's why we came up with the standard keyboard and found sort of artificial intelligence ways of having it understand what you meant to type, even if your finger didn't touch exactly on that button on the screen. So that was one of the biggest risks, one of the hardest design things we did uh, that worked out well. We also had you know, lots of discussions about how many buttons, physical buttons should be on the front of the phone. And there, there, was, there are arguments for like four buttons, three buttons, zero buttons. Uh, and we ended up with that one button. And the reason was we, we didn't want people to be afraid of going into any of the apps. And we didn't want them ever to feel like, oh, I'm lost, I don't know how to get back somewhere. And so with a single button, it's very easy. If you're ever confused, if you ever feel uh, uneasy, you press that button, you get back to the home screen. It's a known location. And, you know, two-year-olds could figure this out. I mean, literally when we shipped it, there's two-year-olds using this thing. And there was this one-year-old when you, the one, <laughs> there you go. One of the earliest photos of him is as a one-year-old with the very, very first iPhone, which I bought the very day it came out. So speaking yeah. of design, can we switch to gallery mode? And I want to have the students on screen who, who drew their own designs for phones to share those. And Scott, if you don't see all these, if, if you see only me, you can click this button uh, on the upper right hand side of Zoom to I see, see all everyone. the designs from folks. So you can choose one that you like. So pick one of these that you think is uh, interesting to talk through and, and to, to hear from the student. Uh, I'm trying to see. Kofi, can you hold yours up a little closer? And you can move the right and left buttons to see more examples from other folks as well. Uh, I'm going to suggest Nick and Reem because that's a really cool. Yeah, Nick and Reem has lots of color. And so, yeah, let's, let's see theirs. 
Can we unmute and have you show us your design and talk us through what you made? And can we switch to speaker view? Well, I'll go first. Um, so pretty much my phone design, what I made it was, it was um, like uh, poly glass, so like plastic glass. And it would all, this, the whole screen would be see-through. And these two parts, these two components would be metal and they would project onto the glass. And then I sort of had all the apps. I had the main apps that, that you use the most or your like favorite apps bigger than all the rest. And then, yeah, and then the battery would be at the bottom here. And what else? And then the banner for your notifications would be at the bottom. And then you have the home screen sliding up sort of like the iPhone X and the iPhone 11, it would, it would slide up. You've designed not just a home screen, but an entire new phone there. Uh, <laughs> you, you have the charging mechanism and everything. Yeah. That's great. And did your sister make a design too? Where are you all calling from, by the way? Uh, Calgary, Canada. Got it. Honestly, I just liked mythical unicorns, so I made a phone just for girls. <laughs> All right, that's one. You know, one, one thing that I like about that, one thing people forget when doing design is to make it actually fun and engaging. Uh, it's too often things become very perfunctory uh, and very boring. And so designing something that is both fun to use and approachable and accessible is a, a, is a great uh, design point. All right, well, what I'd love to do is to have the audience if anybody submitted questions for Scott. Uh, Akira, do we have any questions from the audience that we can ask of Scott? Hello, yes, we do. Um, so we have a handful of questions today, actually one for Scott and one for Hadi. So um, Scott, we have Austin C from Mountain View, California. And he said, how have the liberal and or creative arts influenced how you think about coding and computer science? Oh, that's a fantastic question. Uh, I. I think that the liberal arts are critical to designing anything. I mean, at Apple, we always talked about sitting at the intersection of engineering and the liberal arts. Um, I mean, I personally uh, have been producing Broadway musicals uh, as well. I mean, I, I think that, that when you bring that creativity in everything you do when you're building uh, an application is design work. And uh, be it designing your code to designing the user experience to designing the uh, interactivity, it's, it's all design. And so the more versed you are in the liberal arts, the better read you are, the more you know, plays you've seen and books you've read, uh, the better equipped you are to build more interesting products and also the better equipped you are to understand more cultures. And since we live in this very interconnected global community now, uh, by understanding different cultures different from your own, you can build products that will work better for people that are unlike you. And one thing, by the way, in today's day and age of artificial intelligence and machine learning, the importance of learning liberal arts and humanities is not only for the design, but also for the ethics of how your code is being used and how it's gonna impact society at a grander scale because some of the technologies coming out are really changing society. Uh, yeah, yeah, and I think it's critical for all of us who are building these products to consider ethics with every decision. Uh, Kira, did you have another question? Uh, yes, the last one was for you, Hadi. Um, so we have it from Akshata in Bengaluru in India. And they said, I want to help my people in schools and in my country learn computer science. What can I do to help them? I'm not sure what age they are, but what general advice do you have? That's a wonderful question. Well, if they have internet connectivity, whether on mobile phones or on computers, you can use the courses at code.org. And if you visit code.org, there's a button called teach which is for people who want to be teachers. Uh, and we've designed that mostly for people in regular schools, but people are using the code.org courses in after schools or home schools or basically making their own student clubs. Uh, if, if this is for students who don't have computers, there's actually unplugged activities, a lot like what we did with, with Ben Haggerty with Macklemore earlier making the dance moves. There's all sorts of unplugged activities that, that people can do. Uh, and those are also, you can look for the code.org unplugged course that teaches basic computer concepts like 
uh, events like loops, like algorithms in an unplugged manner, and you can use those in your community. Uh, there's over a million teachers around the world teaching using code.org in their classrooms, uh, and you can become a young teacher in, in India or anywhere you want. Uh, yeah, and like, let me put a plug in. I actually used the code.org uh, materials to teach at Boys and Girls Club before, uh, and the materials are fantastic. And right now, when people are sheltering at home, is a perfect time to learn computer science. It is a perfect time. It's, it's such a great thing to learn while you're at home. Uh, so we're wrapping up our episode. Uh, and one thing I wanna say is if you want to continue your learning, we're gonna email you this week's challenges. If you aren't on our email list, go to code.org slash break and sign up and we'll send you the code for, to basically learn to make your own dance party or to make your own escape room app. Uh, if you wanna come back on next week to share what you've created, you can, have your mom and dad share what you create on social media with hashtag codebreak, or you can email them to us directly. Uh, and also the thing I wanna say is these challenges always include an aspect that can be done on a smartphone if you don't have a computer or even without a device. And lastly, don't forget to go to code.org slash shop to get either a cool hat or t-shirt like we're, we're wearing. So thank you, Scott, so much for being this week's special guest. It was an honor and privilege to have you on, on with us. Next I week's was happy special to be guest. here. <laughs> yes, thank you. You're so gracious for your time. Next week, our special guest is going to be the actress Kat Graham and the Australian singer Cody Simpson. It's going to be a particularly neat episode as we talk about AI and machine learning and the ethics in computing. Uh, if you enjoyed today's episode, please invite other friends and families to join us. Uh, I want to give an extra special thanks to Scott. Can we switch to gallery mode uh, and everybody can wave goodbye to Scott? Uh, thank you, Scott. Uh, and for everybody who is at home, uh, if you're studying alone, take a code break, and we'll see you all next week. Bye-bye.